Good morning. We're really happy to see you here at 8.30. I know it's a little bit early. I'm Jacqueline Cronus, and I'm an ethics strategist on the cognition team at Microsoft. And I'm Peter Dewood. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft um, leading facial recognition. And we're going to start out this morning with a little video that we recorded last week. I think this video starts by answering the question, what's with all the hype about uh, facial recognition being 100% accurate. I was doing some uh, retrospective kind of research on this last night, and I found a paper from 2008 that said facial recognition has achieved 100% accuracy. And I recently saw a statistic that said that after installing facial recognition, uh, this police department had been able to reduce violent crime by 70%. And I think Peter and I would agree that these probably aren't realistic statistics, and so we're going to talk about why. If you just took the best AI in the world, and you took a camera, and you threw it at a door, it works sometimes. But then all of a sudden, there's a whole group of people who will try opening that door, and the door will be like, nope, sorry, don't have any clue who you are. That door is going to stay closed. We know that we have challenges in our societies around fairness. And so if we don't plan for those things, we don't think carefully about what the models are actually doing, we'll end up in a place where it's not fair. There are six principles for ethical AI at Microsoft. They are fairness, transparency, privacy, reliability, accountability, and inclusion. AI brings on new challenges because it's a probabilistic system rather than deterministic, so you don't always know exactly what outcome you're going to get. Transparency and accountability and reliability are even more important. We really had spent a meaningful amount of time thinking about how not to build a biased AI. When we sat down and thought about it, we're like, wow, we have an opportunity to make a difference to our org and to our company. We need to fundamentally change the way we as engineers, product planners, and leadership hold ourselves accountable for considering these principles and ethical design in the business conversation, in the experience conversation, in the engineering conversation. Particularly for facial recognition, fairness is probably the most important principle to focus on. It requires that the data that you collect represents the full spectrum of human diversity. The objective is to actually make the environment safer, but also make it more frictionless and more effortless to navigate. If you think about deploying a system for allowing people into buildings, the people are going to pay attention to how often the system is wrong, not how often the system is right. And it's easy to notice if those errors tend to be occurring for one particular group of people versus other people where it seems to be relatively error-free. Sometimes people want to say, well, of course computer vision systems don't work as well for group X or Y because of the way that the cameras work, or because of physics was one comment that I saw. That's not true. The worst thing we can do is keep doing the muscle of build something and then figure out whether it meets the principles. The people who are using our platforms are starting to have these conversations. So I think we have the right expertise. I think we have the right passion. I don't think we have all the answers. But that's what's most exciting about it. So we didn't show you the video because uh, we want to be substitute teachers and not lecture. We showed you the video because we wanted to set up the discussion about uh, building access, which Peter will be talking about quite a bit in the next section. I just wanted to start by level setting. I probably don't need to do this as much with this audience about what we're talking about when we're talking about facial recognition, because the concepts within facial recognition get really confused. Um, it's part of computer vision. And then within face scenarios, there's face detection, which is just, are there human faces in this image, and how many, and where are they? Attribute classifiers, which are usually binary classifiers that predict things like gender, whether or not someone is smiling, um, and uh, you know, uh, generally how old they are. And then there's facial recognition, which has two flavors. There's identification, which is the question, is this person one of the people in this database, and if so, which one, or do they, are they not in this database? And then there's verification. Generally there we're talking about second factor authentication. So if I scan my badge in the door at Microsoft, it can look up my employee number based on my badge and then find if the um, image for that person in our database matches the image of me. So in a lot of cases, verification has a lot to offer without some of the um, 
more difficult problems that you encounter with identification, but we'll talk about that as we kind of go, go along. As I mentioned before, these are Microsoft's principles for ethical AI, and we're gonna go through each one of them and then talk about how they apply to facial recognition. Fairness, systems should treat everyone fairly. We have a really good case study on this one because these two researchers, Joy Boalomini and Tim McGabrew, um, created this study called Gender Shades about, uh, it's been about a year and a half ago now. And they were looking at an attribute classifier. So it wasn't facial recognition, it was our gender classifier. And they looked at our gender classifier, IBMs, and face-to-face. -face. And we're just going to talk about our results today. When they first um, decided to do this research, the biggest problem that they came up with was that they didn't have a good data set to evaluate the classifiers on because most publicly available computer vision databases are what they call pale and male. So uh, people with pale skin are overrepresented and men tend to be overrepresented. So they created a new database in order to be able to evaluate these classifiers called the Parliaments Database. What they did was they looked at the parliaments across the world and they selected for parliaments where there was fairly equal gender representation and then they selected some parliaments where people tended to have darker skin and some parliaments where they tended to have lighter skin and so they were able to create this balanced data set to evaluate the gender classifiers. We didn't do so well. We had a 20.8% 20 error rate with women with dark skin compared to 1.7 for women with light skin, 6% for men with dark skin, and 0.0% for men with light skin. So while our overall number might have looked just fine on a pale and male database because the group that wasn't performing as well um, would not have been as represented, this work clearly showed where we had areas to improve. The good news is that they reran the study um, a year uh, in February. They announced the new study, um, and they found that our error rate for women with dark skin had dropped to 1.5 percent, and the error rates for women with light skin and men with dark skin had also dropped. What happened uh, to cause this change? What happened was that investment drives improvement. Um, so we made a huge investment in working on this problem. We gathered data specifically um, in the best, most uh, ethical way we could. So we um, actually intercepted people and we paid them to collect their data so that we could get a data set that would be more accurately representative of these populations. And we spent time, our engineering team spent time working to make this as accurate as they could across these groups. The second thing is that we're encouraging people to think about the error rates rather than the accuracy rates. Because oftentimes when you look at the accuracy rates and they're in the 90s, 92 doesn't sound that different than 98, but 8% is a lot different than 2%. The next thing is to decompose the errors. This research clearly shows that if we hadn't been decomposing, if we weren't decomposing errors at that time, we really should have been because we had a problem. And we need to look at these intersections because if you just looked at the error rate for women um, with light skin and men with dark skin, you're not going to suddenly predict that you're gonna to get to 20% error rate for women with dark skin, right? So it was really important that we had those intersectional groups in order to evaluate the data. There's more challenge though. I can't say that we've actually finished our work here because relative differences really matter, which I alluded to a little bit when I was talking about looking at error rates. 20 million people a year visit Macy's in New York Square. Or in, <coughs> and let's assume that there's a 50-50 gender split and that the skin tone split is about even as well. This is what the results would be if you use that gender classifier with those small error rates. You'd get 304,000 women with dark skin uh, misgendered versus 68,000 to 66,000 for women with light skin and men with dark skin and still 0% for men with light skin. So the question here is, first of all, we have to pay attention to these <clears throat> relative differences even when the error rates are small. And we have to ask ourselves whether we think this is a fair result or not. And I think it really probably depends on how you're using it. If you're doing some group level aggregate statistics you, and you know that you're gonna have more error in one group, maybe you can find some way to correct for that in your numbers. But if you're trying to make a decision about an individual person, this is not great. 
right? This is not fair. So let's talk about reliability. <clears throat> Something I alluded to at the beginning is that there's a lot of headlines about these systems being 100% accurate. And there's a huge difference between uh, what we can get on a really well-developed uh, evaluation data set and what happens in the real world. So this is from a case study of a police department and um, they had implemented facial recognition and they had some researchers along their journey with them to do both quant and, qu and qualitative work on how well it worked. You might have heard this cited because what people say when they cite this research is just 10% of the cases were true positives. The biggest cause of the low rate of true positives was that only 69% six, uh, of the images were rejected from the system for quality reasons. And this happens because the police were used to using cameras for surveillance where they were generally going for a wide angle um, to capture as much of the environment as possible and then narrowing, narrowing, narrowing and you know, kind of blowing it up and losing the resolution to zero in on a specific person. But with facial recognition, we really need to focus on the specific person. Just one second. Got it? Yeah. So of those pictures that, were, that the machine was not able to use, 61% of them were usable by humans, which shows that there's a difference between what the system needs and what humans need. Then of the ones that the photos were good enough to process, they still had a false positive rate of 9%. So people being identified as a person in this database when they should not have been. And then of the true positives, 13% of all of the photos were true positives returned in rank one on the list of potential people who this could have been in the database. And then you've got, you know, 7% in rank two to 10 and 2% in rank 11 plus. Why am I bothering to show you this when these were actually true positive results? Because they return a list in this case of 200 candidates and sometimes that candidate's not going to be there. And so the probability that someone in rank 11 is actually correct versus is actually incorrect is pretty high. And so even though you ended up getting a true positive hit from somebody in rank 11 plus, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's where your um, boundary should be in terms of returning a, a correct res a, a candidate result, right? So if, um, we, re if we get the, uh, almost virtually everybody is in, uh, position one or somewhere in two to 10. So if we're returning a candidate list of um, 10 candidates, that's a lot safer than returning a list of 200 in terms of ending up um, going out and contacting people that probably um, are not the correct person. So reliability is strongly influenced by image quality. This is going to be true for any implementation, and it's something that everyone needs to pay a lot of attention to. Um, images that are useful to people are not necessarily use, uh, useful to machines, and so we need to look at it that way and see what the machine um, is using. Um, of matches, about one in three were false, even at the cases that they got right, or, sorry, even with the photos that, that worked for the machine. And so um, there's a lot more work that would need to be done on this implementation to make this really reliable. And um, as I mentioned, many of the results would end up being um, past 10 and they were returning 200. And so um, they should think about that. And then finally, the really important question is what's the impact of false positives on people who are identified? In this case, the impact was that someone was, that a police, came, a police member came up to a person and asked for their ID and tried to confirm their identity as someone on this list of suspects. That's not neutral, right? And so we need to think about the impact of the um, false positive case in this case on the people who are um, identified, even though our goal is to you know, find those true positives. So it's a trade-off. With privacy and security, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to say that when we are talking about physical circumstances, physical places, 
there's new concerns about privacy and data collection. The picture I'm showing you here is from a train station in Berlin. I was doing some work in Berlin, some research in Berlin a couple of years ago, and I was very surprised to find out that they were doing a trial of facial recognition at their um, train station given Berlin's focus, or Germany's focus, and specifically Berlin on privacy. But what they had done, as you can see, is there's big stickers on the floor, there's a sticker on the ceiling. Um, I don't think you can see it right now, but there's a sticker on the door. They were making sure that there was this very conspicuous, that everyone knew what was going on and that they weren't trying to hide anything. They also, for the trials, spent a lot of time on press and they had several big interviews and they made sure everybody was aware. They recruited people individually to participate in the trial in person. And then um, they were just kind of trying to take a step forward at a time to see how people reacted to it and what kind of results they got. So this evaluation period, um, no matter what your implementation is, is going to be super important. And I think they did a pretty good job of at least making sure people were aware of it. In terms of inclusiveness, I think one of the things we forget sometimes is that accessibility is not just about making sure that something works as well for people who have different abilities, but it can also be about developing things specifically for people who have uh, differing abilities. So Seeing AI is a great example of this. Um, Seeing AI uses a huge variety of, of computer vision techniques at Microsoft, including um, text reading so people can read menus. Um, you can identify that there's people around you. You can identify where there's an empty seat. And there are more and more features coming. Um, this is a great start. And I think we need to do more work like this in our industry to look at how the technology can um, supplement the abilities of people who um, might not have full spectrum of abilities in addition to making things work for people of differing abilities. The second thing that I like to talk about with inclusiveness is really understanding stakeholder perceptions. And I think this is something that we forget sometimes. So a lot of times in our implementations, the customer is a big enterprise, but stakeholders are that customer's customers, that customer's employees, and even people that might not intend to be caught up in the system, but somehow are. And their perceptions are really important. Um, when I was starting this research, the interesting thing to me was that the, um, a lot of the engineers were saying, uh, well, you know, there's already cameras everywhere, so people are used to them. If the function of the camera changes, it doesn't really change how people perceive it. I didn't think that was true, and so I'm gonna give you a specific case where that definitely wasn't true. So this respondent was talking about cameras in the ceiling at Target. And his perception was that that was fine because something might go wrong and you would need video to find out what had happened. The same person then said, well, but when they put the um, video screens up at the checkout, I was like, why are they doing this? Why are they watching me? Because I don't know what's going on. I don't know where the data is going. So I just stopped going to self-checkout. Same person. Um, but and it, and it, in both cases, it's about the cameras, but the context of use really changes how people will think about the technology, and it's really important to understand that. I also did some work on um, understanding traveler perceptions of facial ID. In this case, uh, we were talking about using um, face ID for TSA kinds of interactions. And the first respondent says, that's great, Everybody knows that I'm good, I don't have a history, I can just go through, there's nothing bad here, um, I can just get right through, I love that. But the next respondent said, I understand that there's going to be a lot of security at the airport, but I'm not comfortable with the amount of data that's collected, and that's because I don't know. I think I'd be worried about the data collected that I don't know about, right? So again, this um, idea of, of, cons of notice is really important. But when we summarize the data, this chart takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, the green at the top means, um, the darkest green means most perceived benefit, and the lightest green means least perceived benefit, and then the, the, um, the strength of the line indicates how many people indicated that that was a ch uh, benefit for them. And then concerns, the darkest orange means most concern, and again, thickness of the line indicates how much agreement we had. So people perceived that this would give them a benefit in terms of streamlining their experience at the airport, 
Some people felt like it would give them some peace of mind that security was improved. Um, some people, a few people felt like it would give them more a feeling of being left alone and not harassed when they were going through security. And um, some people felt like it was a pretty consistent process and that would be great. But if you look at the strongest concerns, people were really concerned about the data collection. Um, that ranges from not understanding what data is being collected to how long it's retained to who else has access to it and uh, what else is happening with it and what other data is being connected to it. So if I had more time and I was just talking about this, I would also talk about this escalated scenario that I gave people, which was what if we did the same thing, but we also connected it to people's criminal records. And there was a really split, um, a really split reaction on this with people who are more subject to intense policing in the United States saying absolutely not. The person who shoplifted when they were 15 is not the person who's blowing up a plane. Not only is this dangerous, but it's irrelevant. And so this idea of um, data collection, it's important to reveal not just you know, where data is collected, where it's not collected, how it's being used, when it, when it goes away, but also what else it's connected to, because a lot of people's concerns will come up there. And I think that sometimes we think that more data is better when we're building models, because some pattern might emerge that we didn't anticipate. But we also have to think about what people's concerns and what their rights are around um, how data is connected about them. Then obviously misidentification was a concern that came up for some people, and bias came up as a strong concern as well. So the idea here was, well, this sounds like it's going to be fair, but I've heard that facial recognition can be biased, and so is this going to also just reinforce biases that already exist? The point here isn't that you should say, um, well, we're not going to do this if there are concerns. The point is that you should really understand both what people's perceived benefits are and what their perceived concerns are so that you can take those into account in your design and see if you can get to a point where the, be the benefits and concerns are balanced in favor of the implementation. And with transparency, I'm going back to the uh, facial recognition um, trial and to talk about match thresholds a little bit. So match thresholds are in facial recognition are essentially just the score at which you feel the two images are close enough that you're going to turn it as a positive match. And um, the number is from zero to one. Zero means you wouldn't have any criteria at all for matching, and one means it would have to be perfectly matched. And in this case, the um, police started out with a threshold of 0.5. And when they had a threshold of 0.5, their false positive rate was 97%. Right, so most of the time they were wrong, like the vast majority of the time they were wrong and they were wasting a lot of time. So they increased their match threshold to 0.6 and their false positive rate dropped to 0.5. And then um, the challenge there was that the, um, they felt like they weren't getting enough hits, right? So they then lowered their match, hold, match threshold to 0.57 and got a false positive rate of 0.91. So um, first of all, there's no linear relationship. There is a linear relationship, but it's not an obvious relationship between these two metrics. And so it's not a transparent thing for the uh, police to be managing. And the challenge was that they raised and lowered the match threshold based on whether they felt like they were getting the right result or not. And so this is something that would actually require policy to figure out what the right match threshold was with some data from the context of use. So the final one is accountability, and um, we've recently published a transparency note for Face API, and the URL is here. And um, the idea was that we've established these six uh, principles for facial recognition, and one of them is that we will provide information to our customers about the strengths and weaknesses of our programs. And so that's what the transparency note is about. It's not necessarily targeted at a developer, um, but a developer could read it, but it talks about how accuracy is evaluated. It talks about false positives and false negatives and the trade-offs between those. It talks about things that you can do to improve accuracy and get um, the most use out of our API. So now I'm going to turn this over to Peter, who's going to go back and talk more about the frictionless access scenario. Great job. 
All right. Um, thank you, Jacqueline. That was awesome. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in Microsoft is um, really think deeply about what it would take to deploy facial recognition in an enterprise. Um, for the use case specifically in this case is we're looking at frictionless access. And, and what we mean by that is how do we make environments um, safer and more dynamic and more flow and allow for a more consistent flow through those places but still provide some traditional safeguards for, phys for physical security. Um, and this is an interesting problem because the ideal world is we don't have doors, but the example I always give folks is we invented doors about 100,000 years ago, and for some reason we as a species have continued to have doors, which means they're useful for a reason. So trying to understand why physical barriers are needed, how to get them out of people's way in an efficient way so that they can have a, a dynamic and, and friction-free environment is super important. So within Microsoft, we're actively going around and trying to figure out, and, and we have two key pillars that we're trying to nail. The first is we want the experience to be friction-free. Um, how many of you today work in an environment where you have to have an access card, and you've got to tap the access card, and if it doesn't work, you've got to go to a security guard at the reception and be like, I promise you, it's Peter, please let me in. They're like, I don't trust you, we're going to call your mother, and we're going to ask for your birth certificate. And then like, no, this birth certificate's in a different language, so now we've got to have something else. So the idea is to make it more friction-free. Um, if you look at consumer electronics, biometrics has been the way we have brought security and frictionless experiences together. You use your fingerprint to unlock your phone. You use your face now to unlock your phone. How do we bring that level of um, experience quality to physical space? But more importantly, we want to make sure that we provide a safe environment and a secure environment. There are things we can do by using facial recognition that allows actually higher assurance. The example I give you is if I take my Microsoft Access card and I literally pick someone at random and give it to you, you can walk to Redmond and for all intents and purposes, every door at Redmond thinks you're me. That's not what I would call safe or secure. It's like some weird abstraction that this card somehow protects us, but it really doesn't. I can hand it over. So how do we make an environment where you do feel safer, where the people entering the spaces are known and understood, and we can make intelligent decisions based on identifying that someone who isn't supposed to be there is physically present in that space. So ironically, every time I show this video, I may or may not be wearing the same thing. So thankfully this morning, I was like, okay, so there's a video at the beginning of the deck, there's a video in the middle that removes 80% of my wardrobe, so I have one thing I can wear that is neither video. So this is actually an example of what we have working today in our Redmond offices. Um, this is effectively a biometric enabled physical access solution. In our space, we have two-factor authentication, well, it's not quite authentication, two-factor access control, where a card plus a biometric needs to be presented. You'll notice over here that there's a card reader at the bottom, and we leverage facial recognition, and this is using the Azure Connect. I'll, I'll have a little bit of a deep dive into what that box looks like in a second. But on the opposite side is a fingerprint sensor with a badge reader right next to it. Um, our claim to fame is we are about we are about 600% quicker than the fingerprint sensor on the other side of the wall. Um, what that accrues to is we have about 1,200 engineers that need to access these spaces. We save about 200 man hours a month. Um, if you do the math in your head, that means we give our org back one free dev a month of them not standing at a door <laughs> waiting to get inside. It's kind of ridiculous when you think about it that way, but that's actually what this number means. Now scale this to 150,000 employees across all the buildings we have on campus, frictionless access actually has a benefit to the enterprise. So before we, wanna, we dive in, I want to kind of explain how we view this thing we're building. And we see it as really five key and pieces. The first is the environment. Whenever you design a system that's going to leverage facial recognition or any biometric or any technology really, you need to think about where you're going to deploy it. What are the conditions you can control? What are the conditions you can't control? Can you, in this case, can we control user flow? Can we control how they enter and leave the space? Um, how do we design that space? How big is it? How small is it? Do we want to have this optical lane structure where people can go in and out? Or do we just want to have a big hole in a wall and let people walk in? The next thing is actually the access control system. This is something that um, 
is really rooted in technology that's existed for 30, 40 years. So there's a lot of limitations on how this works. For example, I, I always say when, when, when you leave Microsoft or any enterprise, they ask you for your access card back. The reason they ask for it is not because they don't want you to have like a souvenir of your time at that enterprise. It's because most access control systems actually have redundancies built in that cache your access for up to six months, depending on the deployment, which means your card even though you're no longer an employee, could technically open the door in that environment for up to six months. And they have no way of solving this problem, right? So there's the access control system that we're integrating to is important. The AI that we're gonna deploy is important. Um, do you wanna have a complicated distribution across multiple types of technologies? For example, do you wanna do people tracking and space as well as object identification and then apply facial recognition on top of it? How complicated is the structure that you want to build from an AI perspective? The third is the sensors. What cameras are we selecting? What type of detection monitors are we using? How are we designing the physical entity that's going to describe the world to the AI? And then finally, and arguably the most important, is the people, right? In any system, they're the most important element of it. How do you build a system that takes them and places them in the center of the actual experience and build everything around them? If you look at any technology that's successful, it's human-centric. It is not technology-centric. It is not like um, hardware-centric. It is human-centric. The reason the iPhone was so transformative is it placed technology in front of humans in a way that we could use it. Today, no one like bug checks when you take out your phone and start swiping. But 20 years ago, no one had no idea what a swipe was, and it looked like we were crazy. But yet, every single person today knows what I mean when I say swipe my phone. So building a human experience is important. So let's take a look at how we built our physical access solution. And I have a deeper diagram coming up, but effectively what we did over here is we said, we wanted to leverage all the Azure IoT pieces we have. We're talking about things like container registry, IoT hub, as well as app analytics. How do we power our IoT experience for the future access control system by leveraging Azure IoT? We also wanted to bring facial recognition, and we have face API as well as other technologies internally that were put together to help us do high accuracy recognition so that users can have that experience I showed you at the door. The final piece is we wanted to solve that manageability problem. How do we make it easy for us to know, are you an employee, are you not? How can we remove the latency and the issues associated with 60 days or six months worth of redundancy storage and leveraging AAD and federating with AAD was the way we solved this problem. What that meant is that we ended up having a solution that was leveraging a portfolio of Microsoft technologies, and I have a basic block diagram to show you in a moment. But effectively what we realized is that we actually have technology today that if we put together could actually use facial recognition to control a door. The hard question is, is how do we do that? It's one thing to have the tech, but how do we bring it together? And this is kind of a diagram that kind of shows you the system diagram. As I mentioned, we had Azure IoT leveraging the intelligent cloud to enable us to control a test and deploy to these remote devices. It scales beautifully. When we had one door, it was easy. When we have 20 doors, it'll be just as easy. On the edge side, we have an intelligent edge deployment with IoT edge there. We call it the vision container, but this allows us to do pre-processing on the edge to optimize for network bandwidth so that we're sending the least amount of data up to the cloud. So we do things like face detection, cropping the face, so the minimum amount of data gets to go across to the cloud. We're leveraging Azure Connect. Um, this is one of those things where we're making a sensor investment to solve real world problems. One of the beautiful things about it is because we have depth, we're able to correlate the distance of the user, understand where they are in space, and say, oh, I can track you as you come closer, Therefore, you're the person who's trying to do access, not the three people having a conversation behind you somewhere else. So there's interesting ways to deploy other technologies to make this more dynamic and friction-free, as well as standing up an identity management service to federate with the legacy physical access solution with AAD. So these all come together to allow us to have a telemetrized IoT solution that enables frictionless access, which that door is. Um, the door demo is pretty cool. You just stand in front of it, it says, welcome home, and you walk in the door. There's a lot of technology and science that's at behind that. Happy to go deeper into it if someone needs it. But that's the system. From the AI perspective, um, 
I always find it interesting putting up the slide because NIST is one of those standard bearers which allows a whole group of people to compare themselves to each other. Um, to be super candid, we did really well last year in our NIST report, and the AI that we're deploying into Face API is kind of derived from that test. So the NIST benchmarks that when we test, they give us a lot more like leeway about what type of AI we can bring, so we bring the best in class that we can provide. What we put into Face API is kind of derived from that, like what are the best insights we can get from that monolithic AI and bring a more cut down, cost effective, scalable AI. But what NIST gives us is a very standardized benchmark. We can submit the same, we can submit against the same data sets, understand how we're doing, understand where there may be biases, understand how we can get better year over year. And that's why they're very useful. There are other benchmarks that we test ourselves against. Uh, Megaface is one of them. And then internally at Microsoft, we have a whole bunch of data sets that we collect that help us understand nuances around fairness and inclusive behavior. Um, those aren't published purely because we collected that data. But we're super open whenever we talk to anyone about how we perform as part of one of the transparent, uh, part of the transparency principles for facial recognition that Jacqueline had talked about. As I mentioned before, the sensor becomes really important in this environment. Here's an example I think we all saw earlier this year and last year in build of the Azure Connect sensor. This is a video that shows the IR image of superimposed on top of the depth map. This is what I mean by we have a sensor that allows us to solve difficult problems without needing to train the user to do something new. Um, we don't want there to be an unnatural way of doing things. We want to be able to track users in space. Picking the correct sensor helps us solve these problems. It also doesn't hurt that it has a very good 4K module on top of it, so we can see really good quality faces on top of that. And finally, as I mentioned, people. This is the final piece. We've got to bring all of this together to actually build a product. And in the end, the AI, the sensors, the hardware, the system, the design of the environment are all in service for people. And that's the most important thing. Like, if that's the only takeaway we get out of this one hour, it's whenever you're deploying AI, whether it's voice recognition, transcription, facial recognition, always root cause any issue you may have, any design decision, back to these folks. Because that's really why you're building it. Um, it's awesome to have the best technology in the world, but if it doesn't work for human beings, it's kind of redundant. So we talked about the golden rules and the AI principles. I want to take three of them and apply them directly to what we're doing with the frictionless access project within Microsoft. Now, the first thing we did before we even underwent the frictionless access product is we brought in both our legal counsel from our corporate legal, our privacy experts, our ethics and society group together, and our engineering group. And I always joke about this, but it almost happened. Like Jacqueline can attest to this. I almost locked everyone in a room, threw pizza under the door, and said, you all talk until you all have an agreement, and I'll keep giving you pizza until we all say yes. But but we thought it was so important to have this conversation at the start of the project because we wanted to be mindful as we went forward because what we found is that reactive conversations about privacy, about ethics, and about design tend to end up costing the product more in the long run. And having a proactive conversations, although it may seem painful and kind of redundant, a lot of engineers kind of have this mindset like, why am I here? It's all about the tech. Like, this is the single most important conversation you have. Like, if there's a business justification, if you know how to build the tech, the next logical thing is how do we do it, why are we doing it, and to what end? It, it makes sense in the context of engineering. This is the second takeaway I want you to all come out from. This isn't like a tax, right? Like, this is something that will vitally improve the products you build. So let's go through liability. This is the first one. Obviously, it's facial recognition. It's a system that opens doors. Reliability is kind of important. So I've been privileged enough at Microsoft to work on facial recognition for quite a long time. I was actually one of the very first people and continue to work on Windows Hello. So I think, have any of you or all of you seen Windows Hello? It gets better year over year. At the beginning, it was very sad. I was the only one with my hand up. Now there's a few more, which is good. So I hope you all remember this guy. Um, we still don't have a name for him. We're still taking offers if anyone wants to name him. Clippy is sadly not an option. Um, I tried. I really did five years ago. We were like, let's call him Clippy, and no one wanted it. But we spent a really long time as a team thinking about how to create a character that could communicate system failures or system interaction with the user. 
And we actually spent a really long time trying to think about this because we realized in a world where the device isn't going to provide feedback, a user will never understand what's going on. And this is one of the best ways for you to improve reliability. Sometimes the technology can't solve everything. You can't pick a sensor or pick an AI that can solve the problem. You have to design around reliability issues. And our good friend here was one of the ways we decided to do it. The other thing I'd like to call out is, have you ever wondered why we put that smiley face where we did? No? Well, if you think about where the camera is on your device, and you think about where he's oriented to that camera, we pretty much put him there because we wanted to help the user orient their face in line with the camera. It was the easiest way to get the user to interact with the device to improve their reliability. Otherwise, people tend to look at their hands when they're typing, right? So we needed to help get your eyes up, hopefully turning your head. So putting you right there, putting this guy right there, helped us improve the reliability of the system. We actually had A-B tests where there was no feedback at all, and all we had was the smiley face at the top of the screen. It did nothing. It just smiled at you. And we found that people were more reliably unlocking their PCs because we had some UI bringing their attention up. So that's important. So a few things to think about from reliability. Like, how do we provide user feedback? So you would have noticed that when I actually went through that door, there was like no feedback. It was this big, like, rectangular thing looking at you, kind of like um, a good old Hal from 2001 Space Oddity, just like an LED shining at you. And our wonderful team has very good ways of providing you feedback. So our camera became a robot, and they put a sticker saying failed feedback. We fixed this very quickly, um, but it was very interesting. Like, when we looked at the failure rate of this door, people were not failing any more than they were before when we had a screen telling them what was going on. But in their minds, they felt that they didn't have the right closed loop with the system, so they perceived it as failing more. And what you'll find with AI systems, it's actually a war against perception just as much as it is a war against the actual reality of failure. So just providing something as a simple LED indicator, which is what we eventually did to show the status of the system, satisfaction went straight up. Failure rate did not change, but people's perception of what was going on improved, which enabled them to think that it was more reliable and they were able to trust the system more. The other thing I want you to think about is how do users understand when the system is failing? In Windows, when we thought deeply about how to do Windows Hello, the number one thing we thought about, and it took us a while to learn, and it took a lot of very interesting user feedback to get us there, is how do we fail quickly? How do we inform the user that we're failed? And how do we get out of the way from the user so that they can fix themselves? The example I always tell our engineers is people aren't using Windows PCs to use Windows Hello. Like, the purpose of them interacting with the PC is likely check their email, go online, do something. The longer you stand between them and the thing they want to do, the more painful the experience gets. And this is one of the key metrics with reliability. How do you design your system to take advantage of any kind of telemetry that the system can provide to fail quick, and if it does, communicate that to the user? The other thing that I alluded to is how do we understand what's going on? And a lot of people think telemetry to be kind of this intrusive thing where we're like consuming a bunch of data about how user, about our users. But a lot of the teams at Microsoft, the way we collect insights are actually product centric, not user centric. And for the case of frictionless access, we actually do collect data from our doors to understand what's going on. This comes through the application insights piece of the Azure IoT story. And one of the things that we noticed is you'll notice that that little device um, C2933, for some reason, is failing about 18% more than any of the other three doors that we had deployed at that time. And all of us were like sitting there and it's like, what is going on? These are literally the same doors. There's nothing different, same human being, same everything. So we actually built telemetry into our product to help us understand what was going on. And what we discovered was the camera and the system as a whole was failing to just detect faces, and we did not understand why. But our telemetry was telling us the door was failing more, and the part of the stack that was failing was face detection. So we ended up going, and we said to ourselves, let's go to that physical door and take a look at what's going on. And we discovered that that gloss perspex, the plastic uh, acrylic perspex, there was a little lip that was causing a shadow to be cast over the camera. 
I was blurring the top half of the image, which meant where your face was was like super blurred and we saw really good chin bones and really good mouths, but unfortunately it was a face detector, not a smile detector, so we failed. And what, what we realized as we spoke to our partners about this is, wait a minute, we went from discovering a problem to being able to understand what the problem was to going to that specific device and fixing it in under 12 hours. When we went back to our real estate team and we said, how long would this have taken you? They're like, maybe two to three weeks. And I'm like, but why would it take so long? It's like, oh, because it'll take two to three weeks for someone to call us and tell us this door isn't working. And I was like, really, you have no telemetry that tells you that there's problems with the doors? They're like, we have no telemetry. The only telemetry we get is the door opened or the door closed. We know nothing else. I was like, geez, guys, like, we might be able to change your lives in a good way right now. But this is what I mean by telemetry is important. You'll notice that we don't know anything about the human beings going through that door. We don't know who they are. But aggregated data of the experience on the door and asking yourselves the question, what is important about this experience? In this case, a few of the metrics that you see here is, how successful is it? How long does it take to unlock the user? How many people have been walking through? How many people per day are walking through? And you ask yourself, why is it that people walking through is important? Well, think about it this way. If the door was performing poorly, people will dynamically start to orient themselves to use different doors because they find that to be an easier experience than having to fight with your system. So the number one piece of telemetry was, if we had 300 people walking through this door previously, when we made the fix, did 300 people continue walking through the door or did we drop to 200? Did we drop to 150? Those kinds of insights will help you understand if your system is actually being used correctly. So the other primary thing that we need to concern ourselves about, and, and this is a bad example, but used to kind of illustrate a serious problem. So do you remember when we went through the attribute classifier? Now remember, this was an attribute classifier about whether you're male or female, right? And how it performed across different tones. Now imagine a world where I just take the same numbers. And I told you, our facial recognition solution will recognize people with this failure rate. This isn't the actual case, but assume we use this number. There isn't a researcher on Earth that wouldn't be like, that's amazing, 1.5% failure rate? That's outstanding. But what if I told you there were 16 million people who accessed buildings at Microsoft, like total sessions? Not, we don't have 16 million employees, sorry, my bad. 16 million access requests. If you take the distribution of human beings, and you take a look at it, suddenly that 1.5% failure rate accrues to 48,000 failures for one specific group of human beings trying to do their job, right? I can't imagine those people will be pleased, right? And understanding how error rates at orders of magnitudes impact experience is on us as the system designers, right? The number, 1.5%, may seem extremely impressive from a research perspective, but what does it mean from a practical deployment perspective? That's important to think through. Let's think about privacy. Now this is, how can I say, um, the single most contentious piece about facial recognition, because this is all about how we inform users what's being collected, how we get their permission for that data to be collected, and what we can use that data for. Consent is going to be fundamental in how we deploy facial recognition in any solution on Earth, regardless of what it is. Getting the right consent is key. And what we've learned is it's really important to educate your users about what you are collecting from them and what you will use it for. What we've found is the more techy you are with that answer, the less trust the actual customer has, right? Um, but the simpler you make it seem, the less trust they have. Right? If you go and say like, oh, we're just taking a picture of you, don't worry, it's fine, just trust me, it's got honor, we're good. They're like, eh, this is sketch. Right? And if you go and say, we're collecting a frame of data, which is just a manifestation of pixels, which we then put into a CNN that will then give us embeddings, they'll be like, ah, no. Right? So being able to communicate clearly what it is you're collecting and telling them what you're gonna do with it is actually really important. Um, the other thing is opting out. Unless there is a business need and the enterprise as a whole is taking a business dependency on facial recognition across all their employees, it's important to understand how to empower the employees who are just not comfortable or for other reasons cannot participate in facial recognition, 
how do they opt out of this, right? There are situations where their faces are covered, they're wearing head accessories or facial accessories that just do not allow facial recognition to work. How do those people go to work every day? How do they open their doors? These are things you need to think about and empower them to opt out and design a fallback for them. Security is paramount. Microsoft, our bread and butter is how do we secure data? How do we secure our services? Um, it's, it's something that everyone just says, yeah, we're secure, but you need to think about it in terms of what are you doing with this biometric data? How long does it stay for? Where are you keeping it? How do you secure it? Um, I love the concept of least privilege when it comes to service design. I highly recommend applying it to any biometric system, like least privilege design, the least number of human beings can access this data, store data in separate containers if you can, in separate storage accounts with separate key management. Normal, like common sense service design will lead to much better security. This is me just saying like, I think we all know how to do it. We're happy to help as we go through this. But common sense service and security design is important. This is an example of how we go about doing consent. Um, in our case, when a user opts to enroll, we actually, instead of just saying like clicking yes is sufficient, we actually challenge the user at that moment for a credential. The reason we do that is because we're federated with AAD, but on the other end, we find it is important to ask the user to go through a challenge to verify A, that they're present, and B, that they, they really wanna participate in this consent. Um, we also made sure that there's very clear labeling of where and what we're collecting, when we're collecting it, and why we're collecting it. And we stood up a website where you can go and read all about it as an employee. There's email aliases where you can contact us and a rude FAQ about everything. Very good feedback, lots of people enjoy this. And the most important thing is that we also provide them a way to opt out in that documentation. So we're literally like, thank you for using this. If you don't, please unsubscribe here, right? Which is counterintuitive to how like mailing works, but in this case, it's really important. So from a privacy and security perspective, always a few key points I want you to think about is, as you leverage Face API or any biometric solution, it's important for you to think about how you communicate and make sure you strip away personal information away from the actual biometric. The, the example I always give here is that Face API generates random good, but it also gives you the ability to take PII, PII or personal information and embed it with that particular data. It may be worth your while actually separating those two apart, saying your biometric lives here and it's managed randomly. And then I have a different table with a different server instance that will map that random information to actual PII. It may all live within the same tenant, but by separating the two to, away from each other, you kind of provide a very nice like barrier of entry where you need to go compromise two parts of your tenant to get all the information that's needed. Very valuable. Device authentication is also something I want you to think through. How do you trust that the device that is trying to access the biometrics and do a recognition or enrollment is truly trusted? And the final piece is about identity federation. This is something that we do internally where we go and say, we want to federate with the enterprise identity that is AAD because it gives the users higher trust about what we're doing with your data. If you just got your biometric and it went away, they kind of have this weird notion of like, who owns this data, what is going on? But if it's federated to their employment, if they go and say, this is part of my ID at Microsoft, they're more confident with what that data is being used. The final thing I wanna go through is inclusion. Not everyone is five feet tall. Some of us may Google what is the average height of a human being. The answer is five foot four or five foot six-ish, depending if you're male or female. Which makes you think, if I take a camera and stick it at five feet, on average, I'm gonna be awesome. The only problem is that these cameras have optimal distances from where to work from. Once you get too far away, the number of pixels across your face isn't sufficient for us to do good, accurate recognition. So the question I have is, what happens if you're in a wheelchair? Well, you have to be further back for the camera to see you, which means you're out of that optimal envelope. What if you're a child? Well, if you're a child, we'll see the top of your balloon, but unlikely see anything else. So the question is, is how do we solve this? Like, how do we build a system that is inclusive to people, whether they have disabilities, whether they're shorter, whether they're kids, whether they're adults? So going through a thought experiment, like what if we make the camera lower? Well, all of a sudden, the average human being can't actually use the system, but people in wheelchairs and children can use it. So 
what do we do then? Well, one of the things we could do is maybe increase the field of view. This will definitely solve the problem, but it'll come with its own challenges. In this case, the average human being will get seen, a child will be seen, assuming the balloon's not in front of their face, and someone in a wheelchair will get seen. So by just designing the sensor slightly differently, we were able to go from one group of average human beings being able to work to a much more open group of people that we can include into that experience. But there are other challenges across the board, like how do you communicate the optimal range? For example, I recently discovered when working with our accessibility uh, team within Microsoft is that there is a minimum distance that a wheelchair must be from a point of interaction. They can't get any closer, they can't get it, because they actually need the turning circle. And we were like, wow, well, that distance is actually too far for what we're trying to do, so we had to go build a different solution to help them out. Other situations we had is for two-factor two access, where you need to tap your badge and see your face, for people who can't tap their badges, how do we solve that problem? Okay, let's go think about how we can do more wireless technologies like Bluetooth beaconing or RFID tags, things that we can give to disabled people or people that have disabilities or accessibility needs so they don't need to reach for a card, tap it, and use their face. So there are multiple challenges that we need to think through, and I challenge everyone as they think through them, think about your system together. Think about what it means. Think about how it works together to include as many people as possible. And if you find that people can't be included for one reason or another, think about their fallback. Think about what their life will be like failing the system and how you can design that system to be inclusive to them. Inclusive isn't just about like every single person needs to work. It's about also understanding where it doesn't work and how you can build an optimal failure case for those people. So the last thing I want to leave you with before we um, conclude is really this thing. I want you to consider the principles as part of all the phases of your design and engineering. This isn't like, uh, as I like to call it, uh, we've finished the product, let's go take a matrix and start ticking boxes off. This should be foundationalized in how you build your product because you start building better products that will succeed quicker and be inclusive to more people faster. So that's kind of the message today is we at Microsoft aren't just preaching, we're actually like doing this because it's important to us. Hopefully this talk kind of brings that to, your, to the front of your mind and kind of brings it to you. Thanks. So we have about two minutes, two and a half minutes for questions. I'm going to ask um, Esther to ask the first, actually, rather than ask the first question, can you talk about the booth? So hi, everyone. We have a booth, a responsible AI booth at the expo area. You're all invited to go there. We can talk deeper about some of these uh, principles and also some of other tools that we have. And we are excited to have you there. So please come by. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes, please come to a microphone if you have a question. Going once. Oh. Here we go. I don't know whether to say sorry or, you know, what, but um, so loved both presentations. They were both amazing. I, I don't know if this is even an answerable question, but you guys are putting all these processes and principles into place for developing ethical technology, and yet you also sell your technology to other companies who may or may not necessarily have the same rigor mm -hmm. uh, of thought. And so the unanswerable, possibly, question is, how are you accounting for that? That's a really wonderful question, um, and it's a question that we're continuing to work on. There are some things already in place, so for instance, our contractual requirements um, state that, first of all, if you're using our technology, you have to follow all relevant laws. But they also say that you can't use our technology to violate other people's rights. And um, that one is a little bit harder to say exactly how that works out and how it's identified. Um, but that's one of the ways. Um, there are other things that we do in terms of um, the technology that's freely available to everyone is uh, maybe not the most powerful technology, and so people have to talk to us before they can use it for a specific instance. Um, we have more um, input when we work closely with a customer than when we don't, 
So we're still grappling with that problem um, of what the suite of best solutions is to make sure that our technology is used the way that we're intending it to be used. But our, but our um, premise is that we don't want to essentially um, resell technology and have it used in a way that's different than we intended it to be used. Other questions? Yes. One at the back. Hello. Oh, hi. Um, I had a quick question. I noticed that most, um, even beyond Microsoft, most tools like this only identify male or female gender, which of mm. course can get a little problematic if mm. people don't identify as male or female. Personally, I recently used the Microsoft Face API to see um, if it would detect with drag queens if it was male or female, just to see what that learning looks like. Unsurprisingly, detected they were female. Mm -hmm. um, how do you get around issues like that, just gender-based issues? Is that something that you're thinking about when you're building these tools? We are thinking about that. Um, I'm not sure how much of my uh, opinion to give you here. Um, but essentially, I think that the gender classifier has limited uses that are, you know, that are really appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, when we talk about the um, facial recognition, um, and we talk, we're collecting data right now to get the most precise read we can on how accurate it is for different groups. We, it's not binary gender that we're collecting in order to evaluate it, but you're right that we do have a binary gender classifier. And um, I'll let Peter talk about how customers are responding to that, but I think your point is really well taken. Yeah. Yeah, like do we need to train machine learning to identify drag queens? <laughs> um, well, one of the things that, and, and we're still very young in, our, in how we're executing on this, so, so take this as kind of, we have spent a lot of time reviewing how we collect our data and how we've chosen to label that data previously. And we've actually made very foundational changes on how we're labeling data to give us the opportunity to be better at that specific question that you're asking. And not just specific to gender classifier, but as many attributes as we can like, reasonably ask someone to give us, we're actually starting to say, it may cost us more to spend more time with an individual asking them to self-label across multiple points of end, like multiple attributes, but we would rather ignore the cost perspective and just get the data as clean as possible so that we represent that human being in the way they want to be represented. And then on our side, be able to go evaluate ourselves against those attributes and then in the future build better AI to help solve more specific edge cases or more specific labeling problems that we know our AI currently has today. So the first step in that process is we've understood that our labeling and data collection is insufficient. But, um, so we're out of time, yeah. but I did want to say our intent is not to collect more data so that we can build a classifier to detect whether someone is transgender. Yes. Absolutely not. Um, the, the purpose of more data collection, we've been working with our, um, our group at Microsoft called um, Gender Expression and Trans Allies Group um, and talking about what they find acceptable, what they don't find acceptable in data collection. And um, the important discussion has been that this discussion is not about building a transgender classifier. This discussion is about making sure that things like facial recognition work well for people who are transgender. Yeah. Absolutely, I think it's sort of a case by case thing, but thank you for the answer. Thank you. Um, I know we're out of time. Um, do you have time afterwards? Well, yeah, you can meet us in the- so We're happy to wait in the back if you have any other questions. Otherwise, thanks for attending. Thank you so much.